honored to get to be a part of this year's Transformed Women's event. I'm so excited, humbled, and blessed to have this awesome opportunity. Thank you for joining me today. I'm excited for what God has for us. My name is Danelle Harrison, and my husband is JJ, and he is the pastor here at Barrington Ridge in Hobart, Indiana. And today I'm going to talk to you guys about spiritual exhaustion. As women, we all know what it's like to be exhausted. Um, and in ministry, especially this last year, I think we all really understand what it's like to just be spiritually exhausted and to feel like, God, I don't know if I can even do this anymore. And, and to be honest with you, as I was preparing to share with you, I realized something. I am no expert. I really am not qualified to give anybody any advice. And so I'm not here to preach at you or to tell any of you what to do. I'm just here to share with you some of, some of my family's experiences and our church's experiences in hopes that maybe some of you out there that might feel like you're alone in, in this whole spiritual exhaustion and being spiritually frustrated, just to let you know that you're not alone. And, and then to encourage you with the passage of scripture that, that God has really used in my life to help me kind of work through some of these feelings of exhaustion and being overwhelmed and frustrated in ministry and in life in general. This has been a crazy year. It's hard to believe that we have almost reached the one year mark for when you know COVID really hit and we all had to go into isolation or quarantine or whatever you want to call it. And it was weird because when, when it began, there was almost this nostalgia amongst church people like, oh, we miss each other. And, and everybody was doing everything they could to have that connection with their church family. And we were, and we were delivering things to people's houses and we were doing video things on Facebook all the time with our family, just trying to stay connected. Friends would come over and sit outside and we'd open up the windows and we'd have, you know, little get togethers that way. And everybody was wanting so badly to be back in this, in this building. And, and I remember the first time we were able to gather at all was Easter Sunday. We had a drive-in service and I remember standing on this really ratchety scaffolding that my husband and our tech guy built and leading worship and looking out and seeing everybody's face and I'm sobbing and I'm thinking, wow, I miss these people. And it was a really cool experience. As hard as it was, it was really cool what God was doing and how God was working during that time. But when summer hit and the nostalgia kind of wore off and all of a sudden people were just exhausted from COVID and people were exhausted with what was happening, you know, with, with the, the protests and the riots and then the political stuff happened and everybody was kind of up in arms about that. And, and all of a sudden people became really angry and we came back to in-person gatherings and some people didn't return, not because of, you know, a compromised immune system or they were afraid of COVID, but they were angry. And a lot of times people started to use, I think the church is kind of a punching bag. Maybe they felt like it was a safe place to, express their anger. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I'm alone. I don't think I am. And I don't think our church is unique in this, but it's been a really challenging time trying to keep people connected in the church with all of these other things going on and people who are angry for reasons they don't even know. People who maybe with, with um, just not being in a, a church environment and around their Christian friends and family have started to stray and to do things that, that that maybe they know they shouldn't be doing and they're comfortable in sin or they're just comfortable worshiping at home because it's easier. I don't, I don't know and I don't have the answers, but I do know that it has been exhausting. And, and for, for me personally, it's not just been 2020. The last five years of our lives have seemed to be kind of a constant upheaval of some sort. We moved to Hobart about five years ago, actually exactly five years ago. Today is when we actually candidated to come to this church. And we knew God was moving us. We were from a town in central Illinois, and we knew that God was moving us. And we really thought God was going to move us somewhere warm. And God and his sense of humor is like, ha no, you're going to go where you're going to freeze for the rest of your life. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. Once we got here, fell in love with the people. They're just, I mean, these people here are the real deal. I love our church family so much. They have welcomed our family and loved on us in ways I could never, ever begin to explain to you. It's amazing. So we knew this is what God wanted for us. 
but we didn't know what we were going to be faced with after we moved here. We had kind of the, you know, I guess you would say par for the course things happening, trying to sell a house. It wasn't selling, but then our pipes burst at our old house, and so we couldn't sell it. We had all this damage that we had to repair. Our, our kids were transitioning fairly well, but they, they had come from a small private school, and now we put them in these bigger public schools, but they were adjusting fairly well. Uh, however, I was still working in our old town, so I was driving to work three hours one way, uh, a few times a week, sometimes trying to keep this job that I loved so much. I loved my job. Still, you know, love the people that I was able to work with. And so I'm trying to help mother my kids, be a pastor's wife. My husband is, is trying to get settled in, but at the same time, he had three close family members die. And then his mom fell and she broke her neck. And so for about nine months, he was trying to go back and forth between here and Texas and help take care of his mom. And then in December of 2016, his mom passed away. So we're dealing with all of these extra extra struggles alongside of trying to get established in a new community and it was hard and it was challenging and we reached that one year mark of coming to Hobart and things started to kind of settle down a little bit and we thought okay we're here now we can actually start being more present here and I was starting to feel a little bit more comfortable and I've always loved teaching Bible studies and I thought okay now's the time I'm going to kick off a new women's Bible study and decided to go through the book of Psalms and ask some women in the church, what Psalms interest you? What would you like to study? And Psalms 56 was a very common passage that was brought to my attention. And I was thinking, okay, this is a cool passage of scripture. I knew it because Psalms 56, three is a good go-to verse. When I'm afraid, I will trust in thee. And when you're little, it's the verse that you're told when you're scared, you know, if there's a sun thunderstorm or you have a nightmare, you know, when you're afraid, trust in God. And, and it's a really powerful verse that, that I think sometimes we just take for granted because we've always known it, or me, I've always known it. But I thought, okay, we're going to go into this passage. And so I sit down with my ladies on March 22nd, 2017. I'm horrible at remembering things, but some of these dates I can remember. And I remember this because this was a day that was going to change our family's life forever. I had no idea when I sat down on a Wednesday night to teach this Bible study what was going to happen. And, and when I sat down with the ladies that night, I'm going to be honest, probably a little too confident in my wisdom and what I was going to you know, share with them, thinking, okay, I've been through all of these struggles. I know what it's like to be afraid. I know what it's like to lose loved ones. My husband lost his mom recently and all these family members. My dad died when I was fairly young. And so I had all of this, you know, experience that I was going to bring to that Bible study. And so we go through the Bible study and I leave feeling pretty confident that, you know, I'd obviously changed their worlds that night. Having no idea again that four hours, literally four hours after that Bible study, I would be with my son in an ambulance headed to Riley's Children's Hospital in Indianapolis. See, my son hadn't had been acting odd and that night I ended up taking him to the emergency room and we found out that he was in diabetic ketoacidosis and that means he had type 1 diabetes so the next few weeks days months years still trying to figure out how to parent a kid and how to keep him alive and how to deal with this new chronic illness that I really didn't know a whole lot about faced with this huge fear of something happening to my child Three months after his diagnosis, I realized there was no way that I was going to be able to keep my job. And so I had to quit this job that I loved so much, loved the people, still love the people, and had to figure out what I was going to do. What am I going to do next, God? I, what am I qualified to do? And ended up taking a teaching job at a school that I did not like. I was miserable. But God provided, and I'm thankful for that provision during that time. And then things really got worse in September of 2017 my mom who was about to retire and she was going to move to Hobart she was diagnosed with cancer and we really were optimistic thinking that we were going to get to fight this cancer and unfortunately my mom passed away in November of 2017 totally rocking my entire world so these verses that as a child were comforting to me had really become almost the prelude to 
a year of pain and sadness. And, and I went from talking about facing my fears to living out my biggest fears and they had become my reality and I was angry and I was sad and I was overwhelmed and I was scared of what was next. And I didn't want to go back to this passage, but God, but God, he was like, no, 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 I'm not done with you in this passage of scripture. I want you to go back to it. So I went back to Psalms 56 and I really started to dive into it. And I love David because David, like me, is a disaster most of the time, but God still loves him and wants to use him and teaches him things all the time. And so I think David is very relatable. And in this passage of scripture, I can relate to David because he's afraid. But when you put it into context, you also realize that he's also acting out a little crazy in this passage of scripture, which I can relate to because I often act out and am a little crazy. David in this particular passage of scripture is actually running from Saul. Saul's trying to kill him. And David finds himself running for Saul, and he decides to go to the last place that Saul is going to look for him, and that is in a town called Gath. Now, the reason Saul wouldn't want to find, wouldn't go looking for David in Gath is because Gath is actually the hometown of Goliath, and David had recently killed Goliath. So David's thinking, hey, Saul's not going to come find me here. He's not going to think that I would go here. So he's in Gath, and he happens to have a weapon with him, but the only weapon he has is Goliath's sword. Now, they didn't have, you know, social media and stuff back then, so there, it would have been harder to recognize who David was, but the people of Gath knew who David was. So they recognize him, and in order to protect himself, he starts acting crazy. Like, he's it's like, I am not, you know, there. And so he's acting like a lunatic, and they siege him, and that's where David's at when he is writing this particular psalm. So just kind of give you some perspective. He's running for his life and he's acting like a crazy person. And these are the words that he is writing to Psalms. And when we look at Psalms 56, one and two, he says, be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me all day long. An attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long. Many attack me proudly. He uses these words like trampled, attacked. He uses the words all day long multiple times in this passage, really indicating that he's overwhelmed. And, and I don't like to make assumptions because it's just not never a good thing, but I can assume that most of us, if not all of us, I'm sure, have never been running for our lives from a crazy king who's trying to kill us and found ourselves in the hometown of a giant that we had recently killed holding that giant sword. I think that's a safe assumption. However, I can assume that anybody watching this has probably felt overwhelmed at one point in time or another. And that's where we can relate to David here because David is legit overwhelmed. The language that he uses here indicates that he is in over his head. He just wants to catch his breath. Like, God, when does it stop? And when I look back over the last five years or when all of us look back over the last year, I know we've all had moments when we've said, God, when does it stop? What is the next thing that you're going to throw at us? And how are we going to handle it? And I can imagine some of you woke up this morning thinking, God, I am done. I am overwhelmed. I cannot take anything else coming at me. I just can't do it. And that's where David was. And I like David and I can relate to David because he's very real. He's not sugar, sugarcoating anything. There's, there's no prosperity gospel here in the Psalms, they are very, very real to life because life is hard. And when you come to Christ, it doesn't mean that life gets easier because it doesn't. David here is very overwhelmed. And not only is he overwhelmed, but he is under attack. He says, my enemies attack me proudly. Like they're happy to attack me and come at me. And in this particular case, it's not a physical attack. David is not, I mean, yes, he's being held captive, but they're not beating him or physically harming him at this point but they are verbally attacking him. And if we have not learned anything over the last 12 to 18 months or so, it is that people are vicious with their words and they will attack you and they will attack your ministry. They will attack you personally. They will attack your family for anything and everything. And it is hurtful and it is painful and they will attack you when you have done nothing wrong. There, there are versions that actually use the word slander. 
And in ministry, I don't know if it's just me, but I believe all of us have experienced slander at some point in time. People have said things about us, hurtful things, things that are not even true. And and they cause us to feel like we are under attack. And, and remember, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never harm me. That is the biggest lie ever because words hurt. The things people say to us are hurtful. And we we try to not take things personally in ministry. I know I do. I get told all the time, don't take things personally. But I'm going to be honest with you. It's really hard not to take things personally. I legit had... A friend, I thought, somebody was my friend, sit down with me once and say, now I don't want you to take this personally, but I can't stand to be around you. Okay. Like, like I'm not going to take that personally. So I've learned that anytime somebody says don't take this personally, they're probably about to personally attack you. That's just how the world works. And, and that's how David is feeling right here. He's, he's being attacked by these people. He's overwhelmed. He's attacked. And at this point in time, he doesn't have his people with him. He's alone. And, and I know that we've all experienced isolation. You know, my family's been in quarantine multiple times over the past year. And, and that feeling of, of being isolated and, and not being able to be with your people, it's hard. And David doesn't have his people here. And, and you might say, well, yeah, but he's got people there. So he's not technically alone. I mean, no, I'm not technically alone in my house. I have a husband, three children, and two dogs. So there's always something happening in my home, which is why I had to come here to record so I could have some peace and quiet. Um, but we can feel very alone even when we are surrounded by people. Do you get that? Have you ever, have you ever experienced that loneliness? Like, yeah, I'm, I'm with people, but, but I still feel alone. And yeah, the whole entire world has been going through similar struggles. But there are times when you still feel alone. You feel like nobody is with you. Nobody gets it. Like, am I the only one? Like, I look on social media and I see some of these churches and, and their, their sanctuaries are full and all their ministries are back in action. And I'm thinking, is it just us? Are we the only ones that that are still struggling to work through some of this stuff. Now, yes, God's been faithful and he's provided and, and, and we have a wonderful congregation that has stepped to the plate, but there are still parts of ministry now that are really, really hard to do. And I, and I look at that and I compare myself and our ministry to other people and I'm like, God, is it us? Are we doing something wrong? And I feel alone in my struggle. No matter if everybody's going through the same thing, it's still easy to feel alone. And David here, he is feeling lonely. He is feeling attacked. He is feeling overwhelmed and he's feeling afraid. And all of these things lead to exhaustion. When you're scared and overwhelmed and you're feeling lonely and attacked, you're going to be exhausted physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. There's no way around it. And, and the verse here that many of us learned as a kid, verse three says, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. And David's afraid here. And obviously for a good reason. He has people in his life that can kill him. And there are lots of things in this world to be afraid of. There are millions of things that can cause us to be fearful. Big things, little things. There are phobias for everything. In fact, there's phobia phobia, which is a fear of being afraid. So we can be afraid of things for legitimate reasons. I mean, there have been a lot of legitimate reasons to be afraid in my life, in your life. And David has a legitimate reason here to be afraid. And, and he's not ignoring those fears. He's, he's saying, hey, God, I'm scared. He says, what can man do to me? What can flesh do to me? And that begs the question, what can man do to me? And what can flesh do to me? And when you answer that question in a really real way, the answer is a lot. Man can do a lot to you. People can do a lot to harm you. Circumstances. We all know there are circumstances that are out of our control that come into our lives and they overwhelm us and they cause us to be afraid. The night that I gave that Bible study, I actually told the ladies that my biggest fear was something happening to my child. I, I went back and looked at my notes. I actually said that. And then I actually said my biggest fear, other than something happening to my children, was something happening to my mom because I had experienced the pain of losing a parent and I didn't want to experience that again. And then all of a sudden, boom, my biggest fears are my reality. Circumstances come, they're out of my control, and 
as a pastor's wife, I felt like I needed to put on this, you know, superficial spiritual facade and act like I was totally relying on God. But deep down inside, I was overwhelmed and I was scared and I wasn't trusting God like I should have. I wasn't clinging to this passage of scripture. I was mad at God because all of my fears were coming true. And I thought, God, I moved my family. I was obedient to you. And we moved and we did exactly what you wanted us to do. And this is what I get for that. Really, God, this is what I'm going to have to deal with. And I was lost in that anger for a very long time. And part of me still can go back to that really dark place. But by the grace of God, he has helped me work through some of that. He's brought me back to this passage and other passages of scripture. And he's taught me to do what David did in this passage. Because this is where we really, really learn from David's life. Yeah, we can relate to David, but we can also learn from him because what he does here is simple, but not always easy to do. And David cries out to God. He is literally telling God his struggles. He's being really real with him, very honest with him. And then he's saying, God, I know what can happen to me. I know what flesh can do to me. But he says in verse 8, and this shows that he trusts in God. He trusts God's characters. He says, but you, God, have kept count of my tossings, put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? So think about that. He is saying, God, you know every single time that I am tossing back and forth at night, thinking about all of the things that that I'm struggling with. I mean, can you relate to me? Can you relate to David here? Not being able to sleep because you are overwhelmed thinking about everything you have to deal with. He's like, God, you know, every single time I've tossed back and forth, you know, every single tear that I've shed, you know, those things, God, you keep count of them. And that's how David can go from verse four, when he's asking kind of a, a, a rhetorical question, like what can flesh do to me? What can man do to me? And then just seven verses later in verse 11, he's saying, he's saying, what can man do to me? And kind of a, yeah, what are they going to do to me? How do you go from what can they do to me? Like scared to, eh, what are they going to do to me? How do you do that? Well, you realize that God's character is, is good and that God is, is there for you and that he is counting your tossings and he's put your tears in your bottle and he's fighting your battles for you he realizes that <clears throat> and he also he also is able to trust god's word he knows that god has promised him that he's going to be king he knows that and he's relying on god's promises so he's crying out to god he's a simple man just like james says elijah is in james 5 17 he says elijah was a man just like you and me but he cried out to God and God heard his cries. David, David is a man just like, well, he's, we're women, but David, a regular person, a shepherd, crying out to God, God hears his cries, he keeps count of his tossings, puts his tears in his bottle, and he's able to say, you know what? What can man do to me? God, I know what you've promised me. I already know that you've promised that I'm gonna be king. These people aren't gonna hurt me because I'm clinging to your promises. And no, God hasn't promised you and I, I mean, maybe he's promised you, but not me, that we're going to lead some country as a king or a queen. That would be awesome. I think I'd be a great queen. I'd have tons of fun and everybody would have puppies. But David knows that God has promised him that. And we don't necessarily know exactly what God has for our future. David does here, but we don't necessarily have that specific promise. But my friends, my sisters, we have 66 books full of promises that God has given us. Promises like 1 Peter 5, 7, where he says, cast all your care upon me because I care for you. Hebrews 13, 6 says, so that we may boldly say the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do to me. Psalms 55, 22 says, cast your burden upon the Lord and he shall sustain you. Romans 8, 28 says, I know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Hebrews 4, 16 says, let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And oh, we are in a time of need. 
2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Jesus, his very words to his disciples in Matthew 28, 20 say, And I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Those are the very words of Christ to his followers. Those are promises that are way better than us becoming a king or us becoming a queen or us ruling a nation. We have this book full of promises. And I'm going to be honest, I'm going to be very real with you. Sometimes it is hard to even get out of bed and face the day. I get it. I have struggled with depression and anxiety for the majority of my teen and adult life. I understand what that is like. Sometimes it is hard to even do the next thing, which might be putting on some makeup, putting shoes on, and walking out that front door. Those things are hard to do sometimes, ladies. I get it. But God has something next for us. This is not it. If you are alive and breathing, it is not it. God has a next for you. I, I don't get that. Oh, Siri didn't get that either, sorry. There is a next for you and there is a next for me. And whatever it is, maybe it is petty. Maybe it is just putting shoes on, brushing your teeth. But maybe it's this amazing, scary thing that you're afraid to do. I don't know, but God will make it something beautiful. One of my favorite people in all of history is Elizabeth Elliot. Read her story. I don't have time to go into it, but it's really cool. And she writes this old Saxon poem, and, and this is her. And she says, do it immediately. Do it with prayer. Do it reliantly, casting all care. Do it with reverence, tracing his hand, who placed it before thee with earnest command. Stayed on omnipotence, safety his wing. Leave all resultings. Do the next thing. And my sisters, I know you're tired. I know. We are so tired in every sense of the word. But God has a next thing for us. And if we are obedient to him, he will take that next thing. And he will do things with it that will totally blow our minds. He will make it good. And so my challenge is to you that are overwhelmed. You are alone. You are afraid. You are attacked. You are exhausted. Do the next thing. And let God do a work in your life that only he can get the credit for. Because he is a good father. He is a good father and he loves you. And he loves me. And I know that it's scary. And I know that it's overwhelming. But he is good. And he has something good for all of us. And I truly believe that. And that is my prayer for each of you watching this. That you will do the next thing. And you will find rest in the arms of the one who gave you life. Thank you.